What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. And today, so I'm gonna do like a three series, like a pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, teaching you guys how to do your own paranormal documentary. So I believe it was Oscar that had messaged me on Facebook and he was like, how do you get a haunted location like to be able to film or to ghost hunt? So I'm gonna go through with you guys my steps on how I do this. So depending on if it's where you live or if you're wanting to go like out of your city for location, you need to find a haunted location. And in order to do that, you need to do research. And like there's several different ways, but of course, as we know, the internet is probably the most predominant and accessible, especially if you're wanting to go out of town from where you live. Or you can go to local libraries, search archives, you can talk to, you know, word of mouth. Hey, that house has been abandoned for a while. Uh, have you ever heard who owns it? Or has there been any haunts in it? Or, or you know, is there some like local legend and lore that you guys know about in your town? So the best way is to start talking about it. Talk to people in town about the location that you're thinking about investigating. So that kind of leads into beginning interviews and finding out who owns the property. So first you need to find out who owns the property, finding out who owns it because maybe the owners will be like, oh, we moved out or we won't let anyone move in because it's so haunted. In the local library of the town, there should be some sort of archive that you can find out who actually owned the property. So make sure you take the actual address with you. Sometimes you can find out this information online but honestly, it's not always as updated online as it is in like an archive. So especially if it's been owned for like 20 or 30 years. So make sure that you go the legal route. When I say legal route, I mean if you cannot find the owners and you've done everything you can and you've talked to everybody that you can talk to, and it's still abandoned but no one's ever gone there, that does not give you the right to go in this property without permission. That is trespassing. This is not only illegal, but this just looks really bad as an, as an investigator in general. Do you guys remember like a couple years ago, it was either like Louisiana or Mississippi or Alabama, I can't remember. This ghost hunting group went into this historic location without permission, so it was trespassing and they ended up having like a drunk party and they ended up burning down this like ancient location. And yeah, it was haunted, but there's a reason that they didn't get access to the location and it's because it was so fragile. Once it was burned to the ground, I mean, sure, the owners can sue you, the city can sue you, but that piece of history is gone forever, ever, ever, ever. I'm not saying that it's not just the legality behind it and like playing your cards like properly, but you also need to remember that accidents can happen even if you're in there. There could be a reason like maybe the building is condemned and there's holes in it. Like, come on, use Ghost Adventures as this example. You guys have seen some of the places they've been. There's literally holes in the floor. If you go into that property and fall through the floor thinking that it was okay, you walk across it and you fall through, the owners of that house or property are liable for your injuries which is why sometimes owners will have you sign off on a sheet saying, this location is condemned, you're agreeing to enter at your own risk, you're responsible for your own hospital bills. So that is another reason why you should not ever, ever enter a premises that you don't have permission to go into. So let's say you found out the location and you found out who owns it or if there's an innkeeper or something like that. What do you do next? 
So once you have the contact information for either the owner or the innkeeper or maybe it's like a property manager, there's a couple steps you can take. I prefer handwriting letters first. So I will put everything I can, like information, like, and you need to use proper English and spell check and just type it on Microsoft Word and make sure everything's proper because they're not gonna wanna let anybody in there that like doesn't know what they're talking about because some places don't want the public to know that this location could potentially be haunted. You need to really word the letter properly don't be rude, don't be so blunt that they get offended by it. You need to just really make sure when you're wording the letter that it's appropriate and proper. And don't just be like, hey, I've got some ghost gear and I wanna come in there and investigate. Like that's not exactly it. You need to talk about how much you like the history of the area, that you've already researched the history of the house, which you should, or location, so that you know more about it, how old it is, all that stuff. And then you can go into a paragraph saying something like, I've talked to several locals or I've read several articles online saying that people have had experiences in here and, um, you know, I'm a credible paranormal investigator, I have a responsible team, and... I would love to come in and bring my equipment and investigate the location and if we capture anything, provide you with a copy of that evidence. So once you've sent that letter, or in my case when I do that, if I haven't heard from them within like two to three weeks, I will make a phone call if a phone number is available. Usually if it's like a haunted inn or if it's like a haunted hotel, something like that is a little bit more proper. I would not be calling like a resident to be like, hey, is your house haunted? Can I come in? Like, it's just not appropriate. You know what I mean? Unless it was like one-on-one -on -one interaction. Like if you're in a grocery store and you know, you happen to hear someone talking about how haunted their house is, then it would be appropriate to like interject and offer, you know, your paranormal services at that time. But don't just be sending like letters to investigate to private residences. Because, you know, honestly, some people are okay with their house being haunted and they don't want to be bothered. And they may not even know, like, it's out there on the internet or wherever you found it. And it could make them feel embarrassed. So sometimes I've had innkeepers call me back and be like, oh, I got your letter. It's wonderful. I'd love to hear from you. Or sometimes they'll email me back. I feel like a letter is a less abrasive especially when you're not in production like most production crews that go to location that we see on tv most of the time they're paying that location a few thousand dollars at the minimum max is a lot like i know alcatraz is ridiculously expensive so just keep in mind that you're wanting to do this for free so you need to offer them something back which is the evidence you need to say i can offer you the evidence back if the innkeeper or manager or owner you know, agrees to let you do it. There's some other kind of walls that you could hit, which is maybe they want you to carry liability insurance. So liability insurance means you bring your crew in and they're basically responsible for anything that gets damaged or breaks. Other times locations will give you that same consent I told you from earlier, which is this location is condemned and dangerous. I'm not responsible for their in injuries. So a perfect example for a place that I had to have liability insurance was an opera house that was in Colorado when I lived there. And they had these really expensive, they were not vases, they were vases, okay? They were really old, super big, really expensive, like, you know, pieces of artwork. And they wanted to make sure that if you're in the dark, you know, because we've done like stupid things where we've fallen in the dark, I do it all the time. And if you bump into something and break it, you're liable to pay for, you know, the appraised amount what that Voss is worth. It can get expensive. It just kind of depends on how many are in your crew, if you have small business and nonprofit, how you open your business. Because at that point, you'll have to have a business license in order to get liability insurance. So once everything is set in stone, like you can sign a contract if you want to. I always make sure that I have some sort of a paper that says I am allowed to use the footage for whatever purpose I want without, you know, being malicious to 
um, you know, the integrity of the property or the owner. That just gives you permission to be able to use the video footage that you collect while you're investigating. When you're finalizing these steps, you need to ask the owner, has anyone, you know, that works for you or that has ever come here to investigate previously or family, friends, have they ever been eyewitnesses to this? And if so, can we interview them? Why do you want to interview eyewitnesses? You want to make sure that maybe 20 people have had the same experience in the same spot of the house. You want to make sure that you're not wasting your time in the evening over nightfall investigating in a non-hot spot, if that makes sense, okay? So that's why having eyewitnesses is so important. So if everything goes smoothly, you need to make sure you thank the owners, you know, after if there is contracts involved, if those are signed, liability, whatever. I always also send like a thank you note by hand in the mail, like after I've been there with a copy of the evidence, if that's what I've captured. If something happens and, and this has happened to me a lot, if you sent the letter out and you get rejected, or if you make a phone call and get rejected or both, don't be upset because it's gonna happen more often than not that people are not interested in you investigating their location. Now what happens if you talk to somebody that like sways back and forth on not sure if they should do it or not sure if they shouldn't do it? So there's actually a property value increase in paranormal locations. And I'm not just talking about private residences, I'm also talking about like businesses or buildings like the Stanley Hotel. That statistic stuff is online, so you guys need to look it up. So I've actually told people don't be afraid to put out there, you know, the evidence that you have in your location because um, it could make your property value go up. In fact, there was one location that I investigated at that was actually an inn in Colorado and the woman was like, it was a tiny town. She wasn't really interested in publicizing her location. And I, and she was getting ready to sell it because like this little town, nobody went there. And so after I helped publicize it and I helped, I did the investigation and there was a lot of really good evidence, she actually was able to keep her location because people that were, you know, paranormal enthusiasts like us decided to go to that location and, you know, stay two or three days and have an experience, not really investigate, but just go to have an experience. So she was actually really grateful in the end that we did do the investigation and it was publicized so that it kind of saved her business. So there are incentives with paranormal because pop culture right now or paranormal in our society at the moment has been more accepted than it ever has been before. So people shouldn't really be afraid of it being publicized with their business. If something happens and people say no, still thank them. You can maybe put a little insert about if you ever change your mind, please feel free to contact me. I've had people that say, I'll let you investigate, but you can't tell the address and you can't say where the location is because I don't want anyone to know where it is. Okay, you know, so you have to agree to that in your contract. I've had some people say, I'm not interested. I don't want to ever be a part of that. They don't say it's because they don't believe. It's just they don't want it to be um, documented, I suppose. So just don't get offended by it. It's just the way certain people are. In order to properly ghost hunt, you guys really need at least three people. You really need at least three people to go. So don't, um, don't go in twos and definitely never go by yourself because if something happens to you, nobody's going to know about it. And that's the same with two people. It's still not very safe. So make sure that there's at least three people on site. When I've had crew in the past, I usually have three to four investigators out with me, um, like, you know, investigating the location. And then I'll have someone watching um, like four to eight DVR night vision cameras just in case there's activity that picks up somewhere else. They can walk us and tell us, okay, you need to go to second floor, room 210 is like crazy, something just dropped or whatever. So that's why someone at home base should always be there. Plus if there's an emergency, that person can access 911 if that's something that happens. Please always be respectful in locations. Like, I mean, wires are gonna get everywhere, right? Like cameras, DVRs, whatever, night vision cameras, but Make sure that when you're like taping wires to the floor, you use painter's tape because it's never gonna pull up like any oils or anything like that, any linoleum, like please make sure because if you use something too strong like duct tape, it's gonna ruin the floors. Also, 
I always make sure that the location is picked up by the next morning. Sometimes the owners will come back to, um, you know, ask you how it was like after nightfall. And I don't want them coming into a giant mess. So usually I'll call it quits at about 5, 5.30 in the morning. Sometimes even sooner, if you're not getting a lot of activity, there's no reason to sit there for a few more hours if you've been doing it all night and nothing's really happened. Please just don't ruin the property. And if someone gets hurt, that has to be dealt with very first. My motto is like safety for my team always comes number one. Um, so always make sure that that's a priority. And when I say that, like if someone trips and bleeds out on their leg because it's broken, but you're getting really good evidence. Yeah, the evidence is great, but someone's like dying, bleeding out next to you. So you need to prioritize <laughs> your teammate or your crew, whatever it is first. And the last thing is make sure that when you're going to ghost hunt, you have some legitimate equipment with you. Don't just take a digital recorder. I mean, seriously, like you're not only wasting your own time, but you're wasting the owner's time. And so you need to go in there like equipped and ready to go because I can guarantee if you do a good job and present good evidence, there's a chance that these owners are gonna let you come back or they're gonna let you maybe do tours there or multiple investigations where you can maybe charge people per person to come in and investigate with you. So if you do these owners right, you can actually get some like longevity out of it as a paranormal investigator. You guys know that I've done videos on like your top like beginner's equipment and then you know the pro equipment so you don't really have to go in with like the SLS cam but you really need to get like your basic gear like a mel meter maybe a couple other EMF meters a few digital recorders handy cams and definitely like one set of DVRs and you guys if you haven't seen that video I'll link it below so that you can watch it again and decide what you know is appropriate for you guys to take with you on your first ghost hunt the ghost hunting part is the easy part and that is you have to set everybody up where they need to go in their proper places for the evening or like say you're gonna stay here for 20 minutes or whatever and then lights out and then go for it have fun and interact it's like the planning of the ghost hunt is harder and then the actual like post-production part is really hard so if you don't know how to edit you're gonna need to learn how to edit I use the Adobe Suite. Um, I think Final Cut Pro is really complicated and it's too complicated for what we do, but it's up to you what you use to edit. And when you find EVPs or DVPs, whatever, you need to not only mark them and have some sort of an editing log, but you also need to have someone else listen to it to make sure you're not only hearing the same thing, but what it specifically says if it's like a class A EVP. It's always better to have two sets of ears rather than just one. Don't depend on yourself for every single EVP, DVP that you hear. The biggest thing that I can tell you and is an editing log is like just grab a notebook, um, write down, okay, this is the SD card number one, whatever and it's one hour and 30 minutes, and then you just really watch it and you start going through, and everything you see or hear, you have to write it down and mark it the exact minute and seconds. That is so that we can go back if you ever need something or think that you forgot something, it's already in the editor's log, and you need to be really specific. Same goes with B-roll. If you guys end up doing something fancy using B-roll, make sure that you're very, very specific while you're editing. I'm not gonna really teach you guys how to edit because that's not really my thing. I can tell you the easiest website to teach you is a website called lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. You have to pay a monthly subscription, but you can learn everything your heart's desire in Adobe Suite. And the last thing, just remember you guys are not in your own house, that you're in someone else's house. And those spirits live there 24-7, so... I don't, I don't care how you investigate, everybody investigates different, maybe you are more like attack, maybe you're not, but just remember that it's their house and not everything's a demon, not everything's dark, you shouldn't totally like let your shield down, your filter like I've told you guys, but make sure that you're respecting whatever's there because that is their home. And if it's a kid on an EVP, be leery because I don't trust kid EVPs. Please leave me comments below on what you guys think about this or any questions that you have. Leave me comments on anything that you guys want to chat about next. Make sure you give my video a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. 
and I will catch you guys next time. Hell yeah. <laughs>